All right, we're live. Hey everyone, up next we have Famida Wyatt Rashid um, from, uh, she's an executive editor at VentureBeat and she's going to be talking about totally free hacker media training. Famida? Hi, and welcome to Totally Free Hacker Media Training. My name is Fumito Rashid, and I'll be your guide for today's uh, presentation. So, um, okay, give me a second while I get this up on the present. There we go. All right. So, we're just going to go through how you're going to talk to the media. So, your hackers, you want your ideas out. You want to share what you're working on. And the best way to do that is talk with the various types of media we have right now. And sometimes that relationship doesn't quite work as well as you would want it to. And that's why you want to prepare. This is not just sitting down and just spewing out all your words. You are trying to manage what your, what your ideas are so that you get the exact thing that you want to convey come across. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about different types of media, how you prepare, what you do during the briefing and what you should do after the briefing. So it's, a very, it's very much a life cycle. And uh, many of you are coming into a session expecting to see Jen Ellis of Rapid7 giving this talk. Uh, she unfortunately could not and she asked me to step in. So uh, here I am. This is gonna be a little weird for me because I am looking at all these secrets that the reporters use and I am going to be saying, wow, Jen really knew what we, we do. But, um, as said, I'm the executive editor of VentureBeat, and I've been writing about technology for about 17 years. Um, and about 15 of those years have been specifically on cybersecurity. I've written for eWeek, PCMag, Dark Reading, CRM, um, Daily Beast, Christian Science Monitor, uh, everywhere. Like I, try, I joke that I try to have my byline in at least one publication. But the good thing with that is I actually have a lot of insights in how different types of media handle uh, report uh, sources and conversation. So uh, let's get started. The first thing is media, despite the word, we're all very different. We, there are online media, there is print media, not as much, but still there. Uh, there's bloggers, there's podcasters, there's, and then you have like broadcast, which is its own separate animal. So when you're talking about media, you have to really know who you're talking to. Um, some journalists tend to be a little bit more um, about like the technical detail and some tend to be more about the story, the overall impact. And you can't really treat them all as interchangeably. You kind of need to make sure that you are addressing your points to fit that media person that you're talking to. Um, one thing I do want to point out is as a whole, we are inundated with emails, uh, direct messages on Twitter, things coming in through LinkedIn. I mean, I would estimate that on a slow day, I get maybe about 200 messages a day. And that's even accounting for the fact that I have a lot of filters, a lot of ways to just kind of parse out. Like if it's a press release, I'm less likely to see it. I'm gonna be less likely to see like direct pitches that are a little bit too broad. So there's a little bit of keyword matching. So there's just a lot of information coming to reporters on a daily basis. So it is really hard for um, us to just be like, oh yeah, we're gonna to respond to every message. That's just not gonna happen. It's just really not realistic. Um, but I do want you to kind of think about what some of these reporters day look like. They generally tend to sign on, they're looking at sort of what's currently breaking, they're listening to various conversations, they're looking at coverage from like the day before, and they're trying to think about what their day is gonna be. Um, specifically for online media, we tend to write between three to five stories a week. Some are obviously more, some are obviously less, depending on what their specific um, organization is like or what their focus is like. But when we're under that kind of a time crunch, we're also thinking about, okay, we need to make us decide what we're gonna write ASAP. We tend to make our decisions in the first half of the day and then write, try to file something by the middle of the day and then spend the rest of the day either following up or working on a longer form or even working on the next day's pieces. So when you're thinking about it that way and you have a breaking news item and you're trying to reach them at the end of the day, chances are that's not gonna work for you because the reporter probably has already moved on. 
So um, I think in a way, when you're thinking about what you're talking about with the reporter, you also want to be thinking about what is it that you want to tell them? If you're responding to a story that you're like, oh, this is really important. I want them to understand my point of view. But if you're trying to just say that, oh, yeah, it's important because and it's just a very generic point that everyone's already been making, then the journalist doesn't understand why it is that you're making a point that really that needs to be heard. So when you're thinking about how you're going to talk to a reporter, and I'm going to dig into this a little bit later about whether or not we're talking about a response to a news or original news that you are reporting on because something that you did or something you saw, there's a bit of a difference there. But regardless of how you're talking to the journalist, make sure you have in your mind what your message is. What is your story? Why is that story important? What is, that, what is the impact of what you're trying to talk about? And you need to be able to say all of that in a very straightforward language. Try to avoid jargon, even if it's a publication that tends to go in very technical detail. You also want to make sure that you're not just focused so much on the jargon that you're forgetting that not everybody who's going to be hearing your message understands that jargon. And I actually realized that myself, that I try to think that I'm a lot more straightforward. And then I was throwing out term 2FA until somebody kind of stopped and said, you realize if you are not in security, 2FA doesn't make any sense. And I said, okay, great, multi-factor authentication. They said, yeah, that still doesn't make any sense. So sometimes the things that we sort of assume is normal sometimes require kind of scaling back a little bit more. So just really think about that. Make sure, so when you're reaching out to journalists, when you're about to prepare for your briefing, think very specific about what your message is and how you're going to say it and what the terms are that you're going to use. Because otherwise, you're always going to find that there's a bit of a mess, a loss in translation because the person is going to just fill in what they think you said. And that's the last thing you want. And so we get to the point where I was mentioning that there is a bit of a different way that you deal with uh, media. One is when it's your news, you have a research that you want to do. You saw something, You're, you just did something that you wanted to discuss in greater detail. Maybe you did a presentation, maybe you had a congressional hearing, whatever it is. Then you're being proactive. You're going to a journal saying, this is what's going to happen. This is my news. I want to talk to you about it. So. The first thing to do that is try to give the journalists a bit of a heads up about it. If you tell a, call up a reporter and say, I'm gonna be doing this in an hour, you wanna talk now, it's a little, you, put the, you put the reporter in a really tough spot. They don't wanna let it go, but they might not be able to give in the time and the detail that you would want them to put into your story. So build in some time, give them a bit of a heads up, give them a bit of a warning. Um, when it comes to the story, though, make sure that what you're trying to tell them that you're very clear about what it is. Know your details. Make sure it's, you have your facts straight. Make sure that you have your message. We talked a little bit earlier about what is the point you're trying to make? What is the impact you want to have? Make sure that's in your entire presentation, your discussion, that you know what that story is about. And then there's a bit about uh, reactive. There's a lot of times something had happened. Maybe someone made an announcement. Maybe we heard about a breach. Whatever that is, and you're reacting to it, and you want to be able to add your voice to it, you have to be a little quick. I kind of mentioned earlier about how sometimes, you know, we tend to make our decisions by the first half of the morning and try to start like collecting stories and try to file it by the middle of the day. So if, you're not, if you see something and you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to send something to you at 4 o'clock, that's probably just not going to work unless the reporter is working on a day two or day three story, which is not always going to be the kind of fast response that you're also trying to provide. So think about that as well. Um, if you are going to respond to an existing story, an existing uh, breaking news sort of situation, think about what it is that you're providing that is unique, that is important, that only you're providing. If it's just that, oh, yes, this breach happened, it's really bad, companies need to do a better job, that's kind of a given at this point. But if you have some insights and, well, we've seen similar companies of this situation, this is how they reacted, and you can add context, that is a lot more uh, valuable. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about pitching as we go on. But when you're reaching out to a reporter and just saying, hey, I can provide this information. Hey, I can do this for you. Don't give them the entire 800 word spiel at that point. Be brief. This is what I can offer. This is what I have. And this is the kind of, um, this is my, cred cred this is how I show you that I'm credible to talk about. Be very relatively brief in there so that the reporters who are basically scanning can be like, oh, okay, yes, let me give the person a call. So that's, that's kind of like the thing I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about proactive and reactive as we go through. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what your messaging is, how to prepare your message. And the first thing you need to think about is, oh, by the way, I love Jen's slides. Like these are all like fun memes that I keep getting distracted by. So this is not mine. <laughs> but um, when you're building the story, ask, is what you're trying to say, is it relevant? How is it relevant? What is the information that you're giving? Is this a significant um, piece of information or is it more of an incremental kind of adding to the existing body or are you changing mind? These are the things you need to think about. And I think it's very important when we're talking about research, especially if it's something that you did, because we tend to get really bogged down in, okay, wait, what is the point of all of this? Is this the same, you know, are we reviewing the, all the past research and kind of confirming that, hey, this is actually what's going on and we need to do it differently in here? Or are you seeing something that's completely brand new and it's going to be changing things and we're like, okay, we need to create messaging. Because it's really easy when you're thinking about the significance and the relevance to overhype, exaggerate a little bit. And the last thing you want to do is try to make it worse or better, whichever degree you go to, but to change around the significance or the relevance. Because once you do that, you lose the accuracy. So one way to do that is really think about who the, who's going to be impacted, what the actual impact is, and what the person who is reading your piece should do about it. That's actually my favorite part about being a journalist, being able to tell someone, this is what needs to happen. And maybe it's not what the reader should do. Maybe it's someone else that does it. But at least you're telling the reader, this is the problem, this is the impact. And this is what needs to happen in order to fix it. It becomes less of a just background noise. If there is some context on, hey, this is what needs to happen. This is what I should look for. This is what needs to be happening in order for these things to be better or worse. Um, I think a really good example for thinking this in mindset is when we talk about vulnerability reports. A lot of the times it's like, okay, this is serious vulnerability. You need to patch. All right. But then a lot of the time, the entire question of who is impacted and what the effect is gets lost because we're so busy focusing on, well, this is a theoretical, this is how the vulnerability works and this is what happened. But then we kind of forget that the person at the other end, they're saying, well, what does the fact that the Bluetooth is going to be compromised mean for me, for my device? How does it change what I do on a regular basis? So unless you as the expert can translate what it is that your information is and what the real world, what personal impact, what corporate impact is. If you can't create that narrative, then you are not going to be able to get your message across. And the journalist who is writing about it is not really going to be able to present it. So make sure that when you're thinking about your story, when you're thinking about your narrative, you're thinking about those three things. And if you can do other uh, proof pieces of information, like third party stats, if there's like previous research that you've seen or done, that will help you re-emphasize what's going on, please provide that to the journalist. We appreciate that information because again, if we can go back and say, oh wait, this isn't necessarily new, but it's something that's been building up for the last 15 years. Okay, now we have some context on how to present this story. So try always, to remember that whatever you're talking about, whatever your information is, it never exists in a vacuum. It's always part of something else. And if you can provide that larger story, you'll always present your story in a more thorough and comprehensive way. Now, the perfect quote, that's always the challenge, right? I mean, as a reporter, I'm always listening, trying to figure out, okay, what story am I going to use? Okay, that's really interesting. Am I going to paraphrase that or am I going to use that direct one? So I'm always going to be listening for it. So you're also going to be thinking, well, I gave this perfect quote and the journalist never used it. And they used this other, like, you know, 
one-off sentence I didn't really think about and I just threw it out there. And now my story is not quite, you know, my message got a little muddled or whatever. So think about it. Think about what you want to say. Take a stand. Make sure it's a very clear, like, this is what I'm trying to say. But think about what it is that your message is. Um, this comes a lot in when you're doing a written commentary. A lot of times, I mean, I know as a journalist, sometimes I don't have time to get on a uh, call. So I'd be like, hey, here's my question. Can you just send me a quote? Can you send me some commentary? Can you answer my questions by email? But at that point, you have a lot of opportunity to really make sure that your message is tight, that you are very clearly answering the question. And don't try to give me a paragraph if I ask for a very specific question. It's nice to have a, like some details, but if you give me a paragraph, it kind of puts me in a position of trying to figure out, well, is there anything I can cut and paste and use from here? Or if it's just a lot of background text. So think a little bit about what your point is, how you want it to be seen, and make sure that it also sounds like you. There have been times when I get quotes and it's so formal and I'm saying, all right, he never said that because I know him, I've spoken with him and he's a little bit more relaxed, he's a little bit more casual about it. So make sure that when you're crafting that quote, especially if it's a written commentary, that you're still being yourself, that you're not meandering, which I've been actually doing in this talk, I think, but that you're not being meandering and that you're going straight to the point. Now, one of the things about uh, the security industry and media is it's a bit of a community. We talk at social events, we talk um, at other times during at the year, and it's a fact. Reporters will come back and talk to you if you give them good information, good insights, good um, quotes. So reporters come back. So build up a relationship. Get to know them. Get to know what the reporter writes about typically. Get to know what kind of outlet the reporter writes for and what kind of audience that um, audience is, what kind of outlet audience that outlet has. So if you do a little bit of that homework, then you're able to give that a value. If you know that this publication tends to talk more for like the consumer audience, then when you talk to a reporter and you give information that is very relevant from a consumer standpoint, you're delivering value. If you know that the outlet tends to be all about engineers and very technical details, then you need to be able to make sure that when you're providing your insights and your facts, that you're giving that level of technical detail, but you're also explaining to the reporter what each of those um, details are, then you're providing value. So you really need to make sure that you know what is it the reporter's um, outlet and audience is looking for so that you can provide that valuable information. And one way to do that is follow them on social media, interact with them, keep in touch. If you, got, if you had a conversation at one point and you had a good conversation, you kind of learned a lot about what they're looking for, you can always send them information like, hey, I saw this, this might be interesting. You can just be like, you know, this is a tip that I got. You're not expecting coverage, but if you're building a relationship where the reporter knows, oh, okay, this is what this person is working on, and I can always tag them and say, hey, I got this quick question. Do you got a minute? Then it becomes a two-way street. It's um, extremely important to remember that we are, we may be on different sides of the table, but we have very specific um, roles and we can help each other. You help me um, explain things that I don't quite understand or don't really have insight to into a group of people who really have no idea what to expect. And I am helping you get sort of your ideas out of class and in the end, we're just making everybody safer, more secure. We're just really, we're trying to change how the world is. We're trying to elevate voices. We're trying to um, share different types of data points. And all of that is possible only if we respect each other, only if we are treating each other with, um, respecting each other's time, respecting each other's like, okay, I understand that we're not an enemy. I don't want this to be an adversarial relationship. We're, I'm trying to help you, you're trying to help me, and we all have like the same goal. So that's one. 
Um, I think the other thing to kind of talk about, especially when we're talking about relationship building, the media world has gotten oddly flat in the sense that there's so many ways people get their information now. It's not just like the big mainstream publication. It's not just the trade publication. There's a lot of smaller players. Now that we have podcasts coming out, we have a lot more influential voices coming out through the podcasting. Um, I mean, even from the blog perspective, uh, you have Brian Krebs, he's a blogger, he's not in traditional media, but he's probably arguably the most influential voice with um, breaking news as well as just providing contact. So you can't really just approach a relationship being like, well, you're writing for this outlet, therefore I'm not, you know, I, tr- I like you better than, you know, that outlet. If you try to try to rank different outlets, you're actually going to find that sometimes if your message is not curated correctly, you're not going to get as much of a reach. Try to treat all the journalists with the same level of respect, um, just be, regardless of their publication. But you don't actually know where that information is going to have the biggest impact and how it's going to spread. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the best way I can say, don't try to front with the journalists. We are kind of suspicious. We're always kind of looking for ways that we can be like, all right, yeah, you're, you're playing me. So just kind of skip that. There's no need to play games. As a journalist, I've never really cared about playing games, and I appreciate it when people don't like who don't play games with me. So um, we talked a lot about preparing your narrative, getting ready for the conversation. So how do you make sure that your briefing, your discussion goes well, that you get your ideas? A lot of that goes right down to briefing, phrasing, right? How are you phrasing things? What are you saying? And a lot of that comes from practice. Make sure you know your topic. Make sure you know what it is you're trying to say. And so checklists are great. Just keep in mind, you know, be honest. Don't try to uh, make up things right on the fly. Don't try to say things that you can't prove or you that you don't know is 100% true. Just be honest. Know what your position is. If it's a question, if it's a controversial topic, know what your stake is. Make sure you know what your message is that you're trying to get the journalist to. And repetition is important. If you're trying to make sure that we're covering a very specific point and you mention it only once in the briefing and never address it again, don't be surprised if during the article we forget to mention it or we leave it out entirely. Because if you're not reiterating it, if you're not building up different points that support that um, message, then we're going to think it's not important or we're just going to say, well, I don't have enough to back this up, so I'm just going to skip it right now. So if you need to reiterate it, think about how it is that you can present it in different ways so that people, that journalists understand that, okay, this is your message. Um, I'm a big fan of analogies. Um, It's a great way for me to listen to an analogy and say, oh, okay, I can use that in my story. Because as humans, we tend to really fill in what we need to do that's new once we have something that correlates to something we're familiar with. So, you know, but use your judgment. Don't try to go into an analogy that's very obscure or maybe even a little bit questionable humor. Avoid all of that. Be very straightforward with your analogy. I mean, one of my favorite uh, analogies are whenever people compare the security industry with the airline or construction industry. It's very straightforward. I know what it means when a building is constructed. Okay, now I use that to think about software development. So there are some analogies that lend itself a lot easier than others. But if you're thinking about how you're going to be conduct, uh, talking to the journalist, come with a couple of analogies in your pocket. If they become useful, great. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, in terms of how the uh, briefing that are held up. I mean, right now we're doing a lot of it on video conferencing, and there's always been a lot of phone conversations. Depending on a journalist, they might be able to keep up and just ask questions as they are as you're going through, or there might be some pauses where they're trying to catch up and etc. I tend to handwrite my notes. I know some of my um, fellow colleagues they tend to just record everything and listen to recordings later. So. There might be a different pause and stop, a stop and go effect in the conversation. Just go with that. Give the journalist time to catch up. 
if necessary, stop once in a while and say, hey, did this make sense? Do you have any questions? So that you don't have to wait for the journalist to interrupt you. But try to give them that time to ask questions, to stay on topic. If you find yourself that some of the questions are getting off topic, you can always just be like, hey, can we go back to talking about it? Uh, that's kind of a bridging. Uh, I, I'm guilty of that. I tend to meander a lot. Somebody will say something and I say, oh, this is interesting. Let me get onto it. Um, I try often after that thing. OK, well, I'm going to uh, put this aside. I'm going to follow up with you on a different call. Let's go back to it. But you should also be able to do that if somebody is asking you a question and that's a bit of a tangent. Or in fact, if it's a question you don't actually want to answer, maybe it's a corporate policy that you're not supposed to comment on um, outside events and the journalist is asking about it, you can figure out a way to bridge it back. Not saying like, well, I'm not going to answer this question, but here you go. But think of a way to answer the question where you're addressing it, but you're going to say, well, you know what, this is related to the point I was trying to make. So then you go back to your original conversation. And it is extremely important because the last thing you want when you're doing a briefing is to find out that you had all these things, these five points that you were planning on making, but at the third one, you got you got off track and then you never got to make your last two points. So you, you wanna be aware that, hey, if you think that this conversation is going a little off track or is going down a series of questions that you do not wanna address, you can just say, well, you know, well, this is the situation as I see it, but as I was saying, and then you bring back to your original point. You don't want to look as if you're trying to avoid answering a question. So that's a little bit of a tricky part, and I admit it. We're going to be looking for the point where we're saying, wait, I asked you this, why didn't you answer it? So um, it's a tricky balance that I'm asking you to do that don't be like you're avoiding answering my question. But it goes back to the original point of make sure you know what your story is. Make sure you know what point you're trying to make. And as long as you have that, it will be easier for you to find those moments of saying, yep, okay, back to my original point. And so there's don't. So this is really weird for me because I'm looking at all of this and I don't think I do any of these. Maybe I do and I'm getting called out on it. But um from your perspective, don't get drawn into sensationalism or speculation. Like, stick to what you know. If I'm asking you, well, what do you think is going to happen? What are the impacts of this? Don't forget, I'm looking for a story. I'm looking for a way to make this like, oh, okay, this is important. So it's very easy for me to just come up with like, oh, wait, how about this? Is this a scenario? If that's not something you know, if that's not something that you think can happen, don't don't build up on it and be like, yeah, I guess so, et cetera. Just be very fast. Hey, we don't know that. We don't know what's going to happen. Don't, you know, we are accused frequently of overhyping security. We want to make sure that we're not hyping. We're talking about what the straightforward, this is the, this is going to happen. This is the impact. And we can only do that if we have your help. So even if we have the leading questions of, well, do you think this is going to shut down the stock exchange? If you don't know it, don't say it might. Um, don't be afraid of silence. Most of the time when I'm silent in a conversation, it's because I'm writing and I'm still trying to catch up. But I do know that a lot of times journalists do just kind of stay silent to see what you might fill in the silence with. It's human nature. We don't like silence. We like to make sure there's always something going on. If there is silence, we start thinking, um, what's going on? And you start rushing to fill it in. And you might end up saying something that you might not have wanted to. That might be a little off track from what your uh, original point was. Maybe it's not a clear a way of phrasing something. And then once it's out there, it's out there. So if there's a bit of a silence, you can say, hey, you there? You know, do you need to, do you need to catch up? But don't feel like you have to be like, oh, the journal's not saying anything. Let me keep talking. Um, don't feel pressured to answer questions. I think that's actually an interesting one where obviously the entire point of the briefing is that you're there to answer questions. But there are times when you just don't think that, that you are an appropriate place to answer that. Maybe it's not to, to your area of expertise. 
if you're being asked to comment on a policy thing and you're not a policy person, don't feel like just because you're on the call and you owe an answer, you can just say, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. You can say, well, that doesn't seem like what we're discussing about right now. So think about how you're going to do that. If there's a question that you're just not sure what your answer is, instead of feeling the pressure to answer right off the cuff, you can say, hey, I need to dig into it. Can I get back to you? I'll let you know after I've had a chance to look into it, read up on it a little bit. So it's okay to take a step back and say, I'm not going to answer this now. Um, it is probably not in your best interest to just be like, well, I'm not going to answer this question on the record, but I'm going to answer it off the record. But once you start getting off the record, you start kind of creating opportunity for the journal to be like, hmm, I'm going to dig into this more. I'm going to do this a little differently. In a briefing, if you can, don't go off the record. Just that's not something you need to be thinking about. Like you just stay, make sure that you're staying on the record and giving the information that you are confident in. Um, a lot of the time, people would just say no comment. As a journalist, I tend to think of it, it's, uh, no comment is not general, just no comment that I don't have anything to say, but it often comes off at no comment. Hmm, there's something there, I should dig into it. Hmm, I wonder what that means. Is that, yes, I'm guilty, but I don't want to admit it. Like it raises more questions. So just kind of think about how you're providing your answers. And so I mentioned off the record just now. So let's kind of make sure that we know what these three terms mean. By default, it's on the record. You're talking to a journal, it's always on the record. Um, I know there are times when people are like, well, I thought we were off the record. Uh, from a general standpoint, unless it is explicitly stated that you're off the record, you should always assume you're on the record, that anything you say is going to be used, that it can be attributed to you. So this is very key that people tend to say something and then say, oh, by the way, that was off the record. That don't work that way. You have to say off the record first and then go on. So off the record literally just means that nothing you said can be used, either publicly or privately. Um, you, that means they can't attribute it, they can't like hint at it, they're just not allowed to use it. As a general rule, unless you know the person, the journalist well, you're better off never going off the record because you're also trusting the reporter to keep their word about off the record. Uh, for the most part, I think most journalists, we tend to be honest. But if we say, yes, this is off the record, that we're going to keep that promise. But if you don't have that trust relationship, it is probably better for you to just stay on the record as much as you can. And then if you can't, just not say anything at all. Which I, I have to admit, from a journal standpoint, I really hate that. But then I also understand that there are things that if you don't want me accidentally using, then it's safer for all of us to be saying off the record. Now, there's a thing called on background. Um, that generally just means that you're giving information as a contact, as to set the stage. You're not agreeing to be quoted, that you're, you're not saying that, okay, you know, you can say this so-and-so said, this spokesperson said. The entire point is I'm giving you information that will be useful for you to build your story, but you can't say, I told you. And again, this is a bit of a tricky area to be in. If you trust the reporter, if you know the reporter has a good reputation of keeping things on background, then that's fine. But if you aren't sure that they're going to, maybe providing that contact on the record or not providing it at all is your better choice. Now, kind of going back to, like it's a little weird for me to present this because for me, if everything, my perfect scenario would be everything is on the record. I can use every information because that makes my job easier. From your perspective, you do still have to protect your sources, your information, your reputation, your job, what you're saying. So if it's easier for you to not be on background and on the record, then, then that's not something you should be talking to the journalist about. Um, okay, talk about weird things. <laughs> but there are things that journalists may do to try to get information from you that you don't want 
to share at that point. Maybe later, maybe not at that point. And um, some of these techniques are personality text that, okay, this is just how we, the way the recorder is. And some of these are actual techniques in order to try to trip you up. I'm gonna run through a couple of them. Uh, one is machine gunning, just throwing a lot of questions at you. Uh, I'm guilty of that. I tend to throw a lot of questions and see which one you answer. And a lot of the times we notice which ones you did answer and which one you didn't answer and we move back and we try to go to back and forth. So again, if you're keeping track of what your message is, what you're focusing on, that machine gunning tactic, you might be able to handle it a little bit better than if you weren't sure and you get a little flustered, which question do I answer first? Uh, interrupting, that is a way to make you flustered because if you're trying to ask, answer something and I interrupt you or whatever and you lose your train of thought, you might say something you might you didn't mean to. So be just aware of that. If you're feeling like you're interrupted, you can say, hey, you're interrupting me a lot. You know, Can you let me finish my train of thought? Take a pause, finish your train of thought. So um, another thing is uh, paraphrasing. So a lot of the time we listen to what uh, the, the hacker is saying, what the researcher, the executive is saying, and we say, well, did you mean this? And we'll try to rephrase it. And listen carefully to that paraphrasing because sometimes we might be, you, we, we might already have a narrative in our head and we might be taking what you just said to fit that narrative. And it might be that we're completely on the wrong track or we just change around what you said. Um, it's not necessarily that we're trying to trip you up or make you say something you didn't say, but it might also come off as, well, we're not quite getting what your message is. So work with us, try to figure it out. So just because we paraphrase something, don't say, yeah, that's fine. Like be very clear in, okay, well, this paraphrasing, did they just put words in my mouth? Is this correct? And if it's not, just reiterate. Well, you said this, but this is what I really meant. Go back and reiterate your point. Repeat what you were saying. Um, kind of going back to the earlier mention about silence, that is often a tactic to just see what you would say. The other um, type is just to throw out a random phrase. Um, just throw, it's like throw out a very controversial statement to see what your reaction is. You don't have to fall for it. You don't have to respond. You can just be like, yeah, that's not really part of this conversation. Or just be like, yeah, I, I see where you're going. That That's not really what something I feel qualified to comment on. So just because it's a provocative statement doesn't mean you have to respond. The other element that's a, a tricky tactic and really, really hurts for me to look at is just the idea of, well, do you, especially in the security media with the social events, uh, just the engagement we all have, there are a lot of friendships that get formed. There's a lot of um, friendly, just kind of like a way that, oh yeah, we interact, we're good buds, et cetera. Some journalists don't actually consider those relationships as friendships. That might just be the part for work. So their trust level and your trust level might be a little different. Um, some of my closest friends are in the security industry. So to me, it's a little weird that some people might be establishing friendship just to get stories. But I'm just pointing it out. It is out there. It does happen. Um, so again, always make sure that when you're sharing information and that you're not comfortable about the on record, off record, that you're thinking, is this person really my friend or is this person just kind of someone I know through my professional um, interaction? Now, one thing you can always do, is you can always say, hey, I'm putting on my friend hat, I'm putting on my researcher hat, so that you're very clear and you're drawing boundaries as necessary. Uh, this is a lot of the good things that we've talked uh, we already. Just think about these phrasing. Instead of saying, but this, say, and this. I mean, that's a security thing, right? We're trying to get away from saying no, but we're saying no and. So just be very straightforward and think about how your message can be perceived. Uh, some of the phrasing here, we take a slightly different approach. Well, I think what you're really asking, these are all ways that you can always make sure that instead of coming off at, oh, I'm hiding, I am taking a question seriously and this is how I'm gonna do it. I mean, like the last bit, you know, I'll look into that and come back to you is super, super useful. Um, 
don't fall in the trap of saying that and then not following up because then that, that trick becomes no longer useful for you. Now, the one thing um, I want you to think about is at the end of a conversation, many journalists, myself included, would say, hey, is there anything that you feel like we should have covered that we didn't get to? Um, it's really easy to just be like, no, 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 we covered everything, you did fine. But no, this is literally your freebie. The journalist is giving you that free moment to talk about what it is you want. So go back, hammer home that message. Like, say, this is my call to action. This is what needs to happen. Add something, you know, if there was like an analogy that you didn't get to use or a point that you don't think that you hammered home enough, do that. Like, take this moment that the journalist is saying, hey, is there anything else you want to add? Make sure that you don't let that go because that is your opportunity to really give that last word. And honestly, this is also a great time when we're talking about like relationship building, just be like, hey, is there anything you're working on that I can help with? Because a lot of times while we were talking and we were running through all the story ideas in our head and working through stuff, there might be something they're like, hmm, you know, I'm working on this other unrelated story and he just said this and this might be valuable. So if you offer that assistance, is there anything else you want, to, uh, you want me to comment on? It helps me because then I'm saying, oh, wait, yes, I did have something. And then you build value, you build relationships. Now, once you hang up or once you walk away from the meeting, once we've had the face-to-face uh, -face again, your job isn't done. You kind of want to make sure that if you promise something that you're going to follow up on, that you do. Um, one thing that you should actually think about, though, is most outlets, do not let sources see the article before they get published. Some do, some journalists do. So don't have the expectation though, that that is a default, that you will get to see it. Most of the time you will not be allowed to see it. You can ask if you can see direct quotes and see if you can like fact check direct quotes. That gets a little tricky sometimes because it would literally be like the actual quote if it's wrong. But if you're like, well, I don't like the way it sounds. Can I change how it's phrased? The journalist's not going to agree to doing that. So you need to make sure that you're clear that you can't see what the article looks like before it comes out. You definitely can't edit it. But afterwards, if you're thinking, you know, I don't think I made this point as clearly as I could have, send a message just being like, hey, I just thought of this one other point. Maybe it'll be useful for you. So follow up. Keep an, idea, keep an idea of what it is that um, you want to make sure your points are and get that sent over. Um, if you told them that, hey, I'm going to get this information to you by the end of day, try to get it to them end of day, especially if they're going to be working on a short-term store and they need to spin things around before, by tomorrow. You saying, oh, I can't get it to you until tomorrow. Sorry, I, I, it's taking longer. It means that you're probably not going to get that back included in your story. Now, once the story comes out, um, share the link, reference the reporter, maintain a positive stone, tone. You know, sometimes we try our best as journalists to get the story out to getting it where we are representing what we were told, what our reporting found. But okay, we were told this, we saw this, we found this, we correlated, and this is the conclusion we drew. Sometimes it's not going to be exactly what you had in mind. In fact, most times, if we did, if the journalist did the due diligence, your envision this is the story and what we came out, it's not going to be exactly the same. We're going to have um, contact from other voices, other sources that might change what you meant or strengthen it. Or we might have decided to take a different analogy that you provided and went in a completely different direction than what you expected. Regardless of what it is, if you want to work with reporters again, don't throw them under the bus because odds are they're not going to come back to you if they feel like every time they write something, you're just going to lean them out and be like, oh, yeah, you totally did something wrong. So it is your opportunity when you have the story. Look at it. What worked? What didn't work? Which analogy worked? What didn't work? What made you sound like, okay, you knew what you were talking about? What made you sound like you didn't? See that opportunity for you to just figure out what you can do differently the next time you talk to a reporter. So, yeah, just prepare. This is, you know, it's not as easy as just getting on a call and saying, go, 
you are on air, just talk, et cetera. There's a lot of homework that needs to happen beforehand. There's a lot of um, pre preparation that you should be thinking about. So I'm just going to recap. There's a lot to remember. So friendly, courteous, honest. Uh, if you're trying to build a relationship, if you're trying to be seen as an expert, these are like the things you have to do. Make sure you know what your core takeaways are. Uh, what is the inf information you are trying to emphasize? Make sure that you are repeating those. Uh, keep it simple. Um, start from a high level, like this is what the story is, and then build up, add on to your detail. Now, sometimes a journalist would say, hey, you know, can we go a little bit more in detail? Hey, that's already too basic. Let's jump ahead. Follow the journalist guide. Um, as, as we said earlier, depending on what outlet and what audience the journalist writes for, or I guess on uh, broadcast TV speaks to, their level of detail there is going to is going to be very different. So you want to start off with sort of like the simple, basic, normal. Um, this is the key core method, and then with the detailed questions, or as you get more into detail, you start adding in a little bit more detail, a little bit more of the technical detail. But if you know that this is, say, a on-air news mainstream TV, going into like the details of talking about, oh, this line of code or this specific type of attack is really not going to be helpful, then don't worry about that. Focus on the story, focus on impact, focus on what your significance is. And um, don't feel pressure to answer the question. It's okay to say, I can't comment on that because that's not my area of expertise. You can say, I'm gonna look into it. Just don't say no comment because that can be construed uh, in a way that you wouldn't want it to be. And again, don't go off the record unless you have a very, very strong relationship and you, can, you think that there's off the record will be honored. It's just so much easier, so much safer, so much more straightforward for the relationship just to assume everything is on the record. So uh, yeah, at this point, uh, go talk to journalists. I'm happy to chat anytime. And uh, photos. We're going to often say, hi, we want to run a picture with the story. Can we have a good headshot? So uh, make sure you have a headshot or two. Uh, and don't try to think that once, you know, that this conversation we've had today and you're done with media training, think of it as every time you talk to a journalist, take that one second, two seconds, say, how did that go? What could I have done differently? What should I do again? Because you're going to just get better the more you talk to people. Your first one is never going to be as good, great as you'd want it to be. But after a while, it's just going to become more natural. It's going to be a lot easier. And don't forget, like as journalists, we're also coming in thinking, well, how do I talk to this person? How am I going to get the story I need? How am I going to get the information I need? So it's a two-way street. We're trying to learn from each other. So every interaction should be used as a learning opportunity. Um, that said, thank you so much for having me here. And um, I believe the Q&A is going to be held in the Discord chat. So um, <laughs> I'm going to let Omar explain that. Indeed, it's going to be a, a after um, there's a little bit of delay between whenever we talk and, you know, people can answer the questions. But if you can actually hang out in the Discord server, that will be amazing. And for those of you that uh, are probably asking where the Discord server is, there should be a link in the bottom of the screen as well as in the description, whether you're watching this in YouTube or in uh, Twitch. Actually, we have several streams going on at the same time. And we will go in a small break and our next presenter will be here within the next few minutes or so. Thank you again, Famida. Thank you. 